Tonight, I'm going to present two programs. I thought these two programs are the things that we've been doing uh, that relates to what Chikyon is doing, all involve volunteerism and how to help on, or get into the communities. No money involved, I mean in terms of fees, it's all giving up our sweat and time. Now, hopefully through these presentations, we can discuss further on the challenges and the constraints that we face. So, the first project, it took us one and a half years to finish. I didn't finish, and the second project took about two years. So I have to talk about these two in 20 minutes. But before I said that, uh, before I start, uh, there are some of our partners, people been working with us, whether having a lot of fun, or have a lot of disappointment, or getting frustrated, they were here. And 2009 seems to be a very interesting year because we started this program in 2009 when they first came back. And again, some of you will find yourself and have a good look at how you looked like eight years ago. So let's start the talk. Now, Singawan, my hometown, I was born there. To me, the impression is about the mountain, the old timber shop houses, the river, and the boat. But to many, a lot of them actually only heard of seeing one when you read a newspaper with images like this, when the whole town is underwater. Um, Sina one historically is a contested place by different parties. First, the Bitayu, which will be lived for the first settlement in Sina one. Then the Malay, who set up a kampong, they were called the Sarawak Malay, as, uh, as opposed to the Bornean or Brunei Malays. Of course, the Chinese gold miners from Bau, and these men who fought with every one of them. So, Sinawan, because of all this, has got some violent kind of past history. Um, James actually started his first battle in Sarawak here, where he tried to seize um, Tato Patinggi Ali. And subsequently, he actually uh, built something to watch over the Baut gold miners. And a lot of gold, Baut gold miners, after they became king for two days in Kuching, retreated, was killed here, or were killed here. So, Brook bought over the orchards of Bidayu, Peningjau Bidayu, and built himself a bangro with commanding view of Sinyawan town. And of, he eventually built a fort after the 1857 incidents of Chinese rebellion. And that's a fort. It's long gone. But not many people actually knew about this, where Sinawan had a very, very interesting uh, natural heritage which is associated with this man, Wallace. And Wallace, a lot of you probably know, uh, is contemporary with Charles Darwin. Now, a lot of people said that he is the co-author of the theory of evolution. And in his book, he wrote a book called The Malay Archipelago, and that was published in 18 something. He described, he described his time living in James Brooks Bangor, catching insects. And Sinawan, of course, is very famous for a very rich in its cultural and cultural, tangible, intangible heritage. And its best experience during Chap Gome celebration last weekend, if you were there. And it all happens around the two raw shop houses. It's a multi racial affair. So, Singawan is unique because the three main groups, like I said before, Bidayu, Chinese, and Malay, they, you notice that a lot of Bidayu and Malay they speak Hakka and they speak Mandarin. A lot of Chinese speak bad, are you? So, so when you talk about one Malaysia, this has been happening for hundreds of years in Sinawang. Now, I wind the clock back eight years, 2009, to show you what Sinawang was like, which you probably would never have a chance to see again. This Sinawang, a very ghostly town, really a lack of human soul. Most of the time, the doors will remain closed. And when you see life, Life usually are very slow. 
Occasionally, you do see some lonely souls. We look for opportunity when we're down there trying to explore. Once inside, sadness unfolds. It's everywhere you see holes. Then with layers of colors, it gave us hints that there are a lot of stories to be told. When it's really wet and really cold. We found this man peeping through the Ajayi door. Did he really care about the future where everything is old? But this captivated us, a few of us who never met. Some of them is in the audience. Look for them if you want autographs. Uh, one is a DJ, a radio DJ. One is a performer. And one is a photographer and myself. And then we start to gather more and more people. Um, we met and we went down there. We thought, we, why do we fall in love with this place? For me, it's my hometown. And I started this when I was a president of Sarawak Heritage Society. I thought, the least I can do is do something to record my own hometown before it's gone. So we got together. Then we spent time making friends with the locals. And subsequently, we tried to convince the local community leaders to start a program that we don't even know who is leading us to. Um, the intention is very simple. Just tell a story of this place to as many people as, many people as possible. So the people involved are Heritage Society, Wu Jiaoji, this is performance group. Um, we think photographer, or uh, photography. And we had, there is no organization locally that we can work with. So we work with the temple associations, you know, the, this committee managing the temple, Chinese temple. And our sponsor is Lai Sat. With this job, uh, with this project, uh, this program, our first condition to everybody is no government involvement and no money from the government. That's how we started with this series now called Reminiscing Forgotten Treasure. First series is the senior one. I'm going to show you the second series here. Yeah? We started by doing oral history, making friends, talking to old people, recording their stories, and we've, we compiled more history and more stories and we put them together. And our colleagues, at that time, I have more people working than me, uh, for me than now. They have got no choice but to, to spend their weekends, uh, many weekends, measuring up the shop houses. And we have excursion, try to find the Brooks Bangalore. And subsequently, we started a series of uh, awareness program. Watch out for that lady. There's a DJ, He's, she's in the audience. And that is the shop front. A collage of all the shop houses in 2009. When we measure them up, we produce a plan, a street level floor plan, frozen in time to show how people used to lift and living and how they live upstairs. In that process, we rediscover a local traditional musical troupe, Chao Chao Ta Lao and we found all the musicians. And we bring them down to Kuching and jam with our friends. Then we went to the school, and that man, watch out for him, is also in the audience. Um, we went to the school and we found more talents. And we grouped them together and tried to prepare them for Singawan Idol. What Singer Idol really mean was actually get them to perform in front of their own people the first time ever when we launch a program that attracts about 1,000 uh, people. You see those happy people and the musical troupe with new uniform. From there on, we move on to do more things during school holidays. So we started to count show the kids or the local students what the town or what Sinawan is all about to them. So from the kind of enthusiasm that you see from this photograph, we will encourage each other. We're doing more and more and more. We talk more and more and more, doing more and more program as we go along. We never had a proper plan anyway. So the group grows. It grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Then we thought from there, 
we start to attract a lot of attention, so we have a lot of visitors. Then we have to do more talks, and we have to do more walks. Then we have to, when you, you do more walks and more talks, you have to fit more people, but we get locals to do, to cook what their parents or grandparents used to cook, the traditional dishes. And they didn't realize that they actually have a local industry, bird nest processing. So then, if you go on, every time it has to be only a few of us to do all this talking, it, it, it doesn't work, right? So we started a training little tour guides program. So we trained the school children, tested them. When we have visitors, they have to, put, to be put to tests. And then after a period of time, you see the local participations. People are very, very proud, and there's a sense of belonging being created. So the most important thing is the spirit of the place has never been changed. So from there on, we thought it's about right time that we have a big party. During uh, the autumn festival, we crossed the street. It happens that everybody so excited that they prepared food to put on a five-foot wear that evening. They, it, we just went on a newspaper, invited anybody who wants to come, free food and free fun, free games and free entertainment. We even have the Malay youth from the Kampong to show us how the cannon bamboo, a bamboo cannon works. From there on, the local community took everything into their own hand. That's what has been developed into the night market that we've seen today. So from there on also, there are a lot of media attentions. And there were books, there were papers uh, written about it. Uh, uh, thesis, and we even have a professor from Taiwan who came and stayed to study the Hakka culture. But it's a program of success. So I think we left with many questions, and and we really have to critically review the whole thing, and hopefully there will be more discussion after this or during the Q and A. Now I'm going to take you 200 kilometers from Kuching to a place called Simangang. Simangang is called Sriyaman now. So we started the second series again with more people. Now Pam was involved and we have museum to support us. Now we also ask for more money. So people with money will come up with more money. Then we have talks, we gave talks when we went down there. See, the first important is we work with local people. You need a local uh, kind of link. Uh, the gentle, gentleman here was actually a local historian, Hu Gao Shi, and he's also working in education department, so he can mobilize students and teachers. So we, we get our source of students and teachers instantly. So we gave talks, we have fun, we sweated under the sun. So the kids would go through the conservation process I'm doing. I was restoring the fort. To go through the whole process of conservation to see how the building is taken down and reconstructed for them. And they smell, they see, they touch, they do. And they learn tricks. So they go through the process every time when I have a site meeting. It's just a monthly affair. I, I went down there in the morning, had my site meeting done before lunch. So we had lunch, they finished school, we met on site, and then we do this program. And they're building things. They're aspire, also aspiring to be tour guides. So we went on Heritage Trail, we found all steam engine on the rails, off the rails. We reminded ourselves of local food again, and we shop and we cook. So the, one of the things is, as we engage people, we'll get more participative. So the local carpenters, the workers, volunteers to cook us ayam pangso, lemang, ayam panggang, so we have a feast on site. Then, when we talk about racial harmony again, it came to our mind. Then we organized cultural exchange to find out why. We brought them to the Malay Kampong, traditional Malay Kampong. It was hosted, we hosted the lunch by the kaka, or not kaka now, it's Shubin Nenek. And, and after, we didn't know so much food, and then we walked next door, the whole Surau community was waiting for us with kanduri, more food. And during that visit, all our participants actually uh, been shown how you go through a series of things before you go to a Surau for prayers. Then they taught the men 
how to pray and the ladies how do they drape on and pray and it was funny when they talk about sunat circumcisions and you look at this primary five to form one kids like so I don't know whether this is a good thing or not a, a good thing but I mean we should know about what other people are doing and uh, their religion and the culture so that we can have respect for each other we brought them to long houses that's more fun less serious a lot of partying and we also brought them to the Kong Si house in Maruk we talk about we know a lot more about gold miners in Bau but not many has been documented about the gold miners in Maruk the second group of gold miners from Sambas. They were not very lucky. They, they didn't find much gold and most of them dispersed and turned farmers. Then we visited more forts around Suriyaman and even showed them how this fort was like before it became this. Then, when the times come, projects finish, before we say goodbye, we have Gotong Royong. Then we clear up the whole place to prepare Alice to meet the public. In return, we have a party to show kids how to play traditional games in the undercroft, which is part of the exhibits. Then they were treated with um, a, a, a night staying at the fort. We have Wayang Pacha, you remember? We have two bamboo poles, stretch of piece of white cloth, and then you watch movies. And usually, this, this happened in 1960s, 70s in small towns. And usually, it comes with Milo Van. No ice box those times, no fridge. So Milo was served cold from the Milo van. So everybody would come up at night. When the wind blow, the screen would go like that. So it's kind of interesting. So a lot of family brought kids and the grandparents to come and join us. Then it kind of, kind of remind them of the past. And of course, there's storytelling by the assistant director of the museum. And Sweet Dreams. These kids were... Four and six, their brothers. The parents just left them there, and we spent the night in the museum. And of course, the movie that we show was the night in the museum. Yeah? Then, these were our friends of Fort Ellis. Those are our future guardians. During opening day, we attracted a lot of attention. So, the politicians, the chief minister, was very, very inquisitive, and he, he really spent a lot of time. The whole program was 45 minutes, but he stayed for two hours. So, then, uh, towards the end, he suddenly called a press release and instructed the museum to conserve all the fort, remaining forts in Sarawak. We can't thank everybody, mention everybody, but if you have been there, you can look for your names up there. And hopefully, in two years' time, I don't have to stand here and give the same talk because I like frying rice, you know, cold rice, you keep flying, and after a while, it gets stale. So, I still got a few more minutes, yeah? So hopefully, in two years' time, we'll have younger people from the audience. There's some of them have spoken to me already to have a series three, Reminiscent Forgotten Treasure series three, somewhere. And I think the sponsor is also here. So more money, yeah? <laughs> so, hello, Brax. That, that is a toilet sign in Fort Ellis. Thank you very much. <clears throat> oh. um, our office of myself, we usually do a Chinese New Year card every year to kind of document or record the, the important moments or those moments that actually uh, we, we, it strikes us. Uh, I have this year's version. If you're interested, autographed version, you can come to me after this. Thank you.